Thank you very much, Valentina. I'm very pleased and honored to be with you, in particular following Heidi Larson. I have to admit, I've never come across a scientist able to digest more than 20 years of scientific research into a book of 125 pages. It is amazing, and I warmly recommend it to all of you for reading. In terms of where I come from, as you said, I do represent the innovative vaccine manufacturers on the ACT Day principles and also on COVAX. Therefore, I see uh, Katie O'Brien very frequently, and I do see uh, our colleagues from CEPI and Gavi very frequently because IFPMA is a partner together, by the way, with the Developing Country Vaccine Manufacturers Network. Uh, please move to the next slide. I must say a week ago, I was really impressed. I'm a former journalist, therefore I, I admire good journalism. The way um, my friends in Britain celebrated this We Day, celebrated the first official vaccine shot outside the clinical trial to Margaret Keenan. And I listened to her and watched it on the BBC, how she described her experience, how she described the joy of taking it. And, and I think this kind of reaction can contribute a lot to also creating vaccine confidence. I have to admit, I quite often say I was born an optimist and therefore I am deeply concerned and aware about the vaccine hesitancy number. As a Swiss, I'm a neighbor of France. In our country, we have our anti-vax movements too. But at the same time, I think one of the issues with COVID-19 is we have in my small, tiny country right now, a hundred people per day dying from COVID-19. We have deep concerns at the university hospitals because the ICUs are filling up. We have deep concerns and personally, I'm a you know, keen skier. I think it's insane to go on the ski slopes right now. As you can see, I'm back in home office where I spent most of the last uh, 10 months because I think one really needs to be cautious, disciplined. I absolutely agree with Heidi Larson. I got my flu shot this year fairly early in mid-October and made sure because, you know, protecting from flu as long as we didn't have a a COVID-19 vaccine is an important element. Therefore, from the industry's point of view, we really, and that's next slide, please, we felt early on a huge sense of responsibility because you have heard from Lisa, you have heard from Dr. Crook, you have heard from Heidi Larson about this unprecedented collaboration one has had, but already back in March, when we talked about what is the industry's role in addressing COVID-19, we had this sense of responsibility that with all due respect to the academic researchers, to the biotech companies, to the international organizations, and I agree with Heidi that CEPI was really crucial in terms of an early response, but we also knew there that at the end of the day, with all due respect to the more than 150, then 200, now 347 vaccine projects, which one reads about, at the end of the day, most likely you would have probably about half a dozen companies with the 10, 20, 30 years experience in vaccine manufacturing, with the experience in development, with the experience in scaling up manufacturing. And when you look at where do the vaccines come from, they do come from those innovative companies, the early ones who made it. And they haven't been rushed, but they have moved and prioritized with unprecedented speed because one could draw on existing platforms. One could draw on what one already knew about coronaviruses, not about SARS-CoV-2. The industry did commit back in March, hardly a few days after WHO called the pandemic a global pandemic, to commit to sharing real-time clinical trial, to increase and share manufacturing capacity. I had quite a few journalists early on who 
weren't believers that the industry, this industry, which is normally so competitive with each other, so rivalrous, would really collaborate to the extent. But when you look at in treatments or in vaccines, that's what's happening. When you look at the treatments, and we will need treatments for some time to come, the monoclonal antibodies, you have a big pharma company, Roche, uh, manufacturing for Regeneron. You have another big pharma company, Amgen, manufacturing for Lilly for the monoclonal antibodies. So you have Pfizer, well known now for the vaccine, manufacturing Remdesivir for Gilead. Therefore, the industry did really walk the talk in terms of the uh, of, of the engagement and the commitments back since March. We also, and I want to say this up front, it's not just about the science and it's not just about bringing the treatments or tests or vaccines to the people. It's also looking at this unprecedented pandemic, I think since 1918, 19, the Spanish flu. The world has not had a global pandemic of this magnitude combined with the huge economic impact. And we saw some figures before. The industry also, I think, realized early on that if you develop the vaccines, if you do succeed, then you need to make sure that they are not only available, but also affordable. And when you look at the price of the vaccines, they are really compared to the impact of the crisis, they are affordable, but we do need solidarity across the board. And next slide, please. When you look at early on, that's why I did call on the solidarity, we were among the first partners of the call to action of what's now called Act Day, together with WHO, together with SEPI and Gavi, in the COVAX with the DCVMN, and also the Wellcome Trust, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Unitate, are in there. Because we knew from the beginning, we cannot have a repeat of what happened during the swine flu, H1N1, which fortunately wasn't as bad and as deadly as one feared. But there, back in 2009, the rich countries literally bought up all the existing antivirals or the existing vaccines against H1N1, and the poor countries were left stranded. We knew, and we discussed this openly back in March, we want to be part of the ACT Day. We do want to contribute with our expertise, our scientists, our engineers to make it work, because we have this partnership with CEPI, which invested in a portfolio, a large portfolio of candidates with Gavi, of course, who has this year 20 years of experience of bringing vaccines to the people. But in terms of manufacturing, in terms of scaling up, you do need the manufacturers, you do need the private sector, be they from industrialized countries represented by IFPMA, or from developing countries represented by the developing country vaccine manufacturing network. And we did walk the talk and we have shown that we can do, and that's next slide. What we see now is science is delivering. There is light at the end of the tunnel. I already mentioned the 347 vaccine projects. We have more than 10 in phase three clinical trials. We know a lot on some of these vaccines about their safety profile because some of the trials phase one started back in April. Every week going by, we learn more. We also, and I think that's truly important in terms of vaccine confidence, we do know that we need to keep expectations realistic. We do know that within the first two, three months, within the first year, demand is likely to outstrip the supply of vaccines. We do know that we will need to rely on this solidarity, and I will say something more on it. And we have had this unprecedented collaboration. I had the chance a week ago to, to, talk about, to have a bilateral talk with Professor Shahin, who with his wife, 
was really behind the BioNTech Pfizer vaccine, who has been named, I think, justifiably by the Financial Times, the people of the year coming up with the vaccine. Forbes has, Forbes has earlier, a couple of months ago, said vaccine manufacturer moved up top the ladder, whereas in the past, as you know, the pharma industry have had their crisis. What we also have seen, and I think that explains why one was able to move so fast, so rapidly, is I think never before have we had so many people volunteering to be in clinical trials. I just want to open a bracket here. I'm glad that up to now, all these clinical trials were done in the normal way. I'm personally, and that's a personal opinion, but we had a discussion with our bioethics committee concerned if one would rush into a challenge trials, which means, you know, infecting healthy volunteers with the virus and then hope that the vaccine works. I'm not sure that this is really needed at the time when the virus is so virulent and prevalent around the world where you can do normal trials. Simple reason is challenge trials may be justified, but you better have a rescue medicine in place. And we do not have a rescue medicine. Now, after almost 10 months, we do see light at the end of the tunnel. We have had fantastic news. When I talked three, four months ago with the leadership of Sepio Garvey of WHO, you know, if a vaccine would have reached an efficacy above 50%, Peter Hortes, for example, said, I'm a taker because that's, you know, good enough. Now, the first ones so far have shown an efficacy of 94, even 95%. By and large, all the experts consider their safety as pretty good. But at the same time, we will learn more about these vaccines. We will learn more about the safety profile. And I think one of the important elements of gaining the trust of people who will be vaccinated is that all these people, the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands who have been in clinical trials, they will be followed closely for at least a couple of years so that we will learn more than we do now. Uh, next slide. In terms of expectation management, I think we also need to be realistic that there will be huge challenges. I recently talked uh, last week, actually, at the principal's call we have every Thursday evening of the Act A. We had an exchange in the chat box on how do you expect the scaling up to go? And basically, expectation is, so far, everything has gone much smoother than most people expect. Normally, only six out of 100 vaccine candidates make it to the finishing line. Therefore, the results of Pfizer-BioNTech, of Moderna, also of AstraZeneca, moving and showing really good results. The hope of having Johnson & Johnson, Janssen coming up shortly, of Novavax coming up shortly, I think has maybe deceived us that everything will go smoothly. Last week, we saw that one of the candidates, the CSL Queensland University, had to be stopped because it created interferences with HIV tests, false positive. Therefore, unfortunately, one had to give that up. We saw that there will be delays in the Sanofi Pasteur GSK collaboration because the dosage seems to have been too weak on the elderly. And I think we need, and that is important, that we communicate also on setbacks, that we communicate openly about positive as well as about negative results, but we also communicate about the daunting task of scaling up. To the best of my knowledge, I hope uh, my team has not been wrong, the highest volume vaccine ever manufactured apart from seasonal flu shots is polio with 450 million doses. If we want to get herd immunity for the world, for COVID-19, we need 12 to 15 billion doses, because with one exception, the J&J one, which may be a single dose, but we haven't seen the results yet, all the vaccines which have reached uh, the emergency use approval will need two doses. 
And that requires a lot of collaboration and it requires a lot of things going well. For example, the glass vials are specialized glass vials. Normally vaccines are filled in single vials, monodose, because of the scarcity. In this, ca this case, you had vials with 10 or 20 doses. Uh, they need to be filled in sterile environments, packaged and shipped at appropriate temperatures. The mRNA vaccines, which really give us great hope also for future pandemic preparedness, they have the advantage of you know, scaling up faster than one normally could. They have the advantage they might also be for future pandemics more agile and versatile to prepare maybe the vision, the hope of an ever warm vaccine manufacturing plant. But also the risk is that you do have uh, the, the problem that you don't have preservatives there. Therefore, in terms of administering some of these vaccines, you might have more wastage if the appropriate temperature conditions cannot be kept. The fill and finish is a big challenge. And just to, 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 to also bring up one issue, which shows that you can't cut corners, you really need to make sure that everything goes well. In vaccine manufacturing, you have up to 450 checks of quality control during the vaccination. And that is something which normally one doesn't realize. One reason is that, of course, a medicine, a treatment is used on sick people. Vaccines are applied on healthy people. Therefore, you really need to make sure that they are safe. You need to make sure that they are uh, also effective. And also, it is important in terms of the challenges we will face is no one is safe until everyone is safe. Now, we do know that we will not have enough doses available next year. It is, I think, a ambitious but realistic target that the COVAX facility, which is really the collaboration where you have the rich countries uh, self-funded cross-subsidizing the poor countries, where in the COVAX we have agreed that Gavi and UNICEF would not only supply to the classic 73 Gavi countries, but expand this to 92. It is important that the rich part of the world shows the solidarity and is willing to cross subsidize. It's also in this context, I think really important that the industry, and they already mentioned the notion of affordability, is willing to offer vaccines to COVAX at not-for-profit or at tiered pricing so that the poor countries will get the vaccines at a much lower price. In that context, it is interesting. I talked to quite a few CEOs from big vaccine manufacturers. They could make a lot of money these days if they would sell, for example, to the big conglomerates, to big companies eager to protect their employees. They are selling exclusively to governments. They will sell exclusively to COVAX because one really needs to make sure that those get the vaccines first, like in the UK with uh, Margaret Keenan, 91 year old at Christmas with the healthcare workers who need it most. That's where WHO plays a truly important role. And within COVAX, we have had in-depth discussions on the ambition to make sure that the healthcare workers around the world get the doses first. That's about 1% of the world population. When you look at the above 65, generally considered as vulnerable, that's about 8% of the global population. And I think based on what I heard just over the last few days, COVAX, Gavi, UNICEF, WHO do have a good chance to reach the ambitious target of getting more than 2 billion doses to the people who need it next year. And that has only been possible because also vaccine manufacturers have collaborated. GSK Sanofi signed an agreement, AstraZeneca signed an agreement with COVAX, Johnson & Johnson plans to allocate half a billion doses uh, to developing countries. Novavax is in there. And what we also, and in my view, this is very important upfront, we do not want 
developing countries, healthcare workers to wait for two, three months after we, they see Margaret Keenan and others in the US vaccinated. I think it's important that at least some vaccines reach people in developing countries during the early time. That's why it is important, and we did have a discussion in COVAX, that one does invest uh, in ultra cold chains to be able to, to do some pilots. Now, at the same time, we also need to be realistic. Not all countries will get the same amount early on. We have seen vaccine nationalism, but also we have seen an amazing amount of solidarity. When it comes to the safety and vaccine confidence, and that's next slide, please, it is important that we do not cut corners. It is important that industry leaders back in September were pushing back on politicization of vaccine approval. There has been in particular in one country strong pressure to get an emergency use approval before a certain election date. The industry actually was probably more concerned than many others because one cannot tolerate to undermine the scientific rigor of an FDA, of an EMA, and WHO is working very closely with the EMA and the International Conference of Medicines Regulatory Agencies. We went public. Uh, you see here the title. I, I published an op-ed in the FT, Vaccine Speed Must Not Trump Safety. I think this was an important statement. We have also supported the EMA statement that we want to go beyond the usual transparency requirement, that we really want, you have seen many publications of clinical trial protocols, you have seen publications of detailed results, including details of what could be possible side effects, like headache, like fever, like itching, whatever. We need to make sure that people know that there may be side effects. Every vaccine may have a side effect because if we pretend you get the vaccine and you will never have a side effect, I think we will get the pushback, we will get the rumors. And when I look at the HPV experience, but also the dengue, I think we know what I'm talking about. Now on my last slide, we also need to make sure in terms of this historic unparalleled immunization which started, we do rely on country readiness. Normally, I learned it takes up to six years to get a change of a vaccine formulation approved across Africa in 54 countries, up to six years. If we would have the similar kind of insistence on national reviews, on national regulatory approval, we would be nowhere in years to come. Therefore, the work which was done by WHO, led by Imo Cook, who now moved to the European Medicines Agency, has been amazing in terms of preparing the regulatory roadmap, preparing that you have a single labeling, that you have the AMC 92 countries following the WHO lead. WHO, I expect, will within days of DMA issuing their emergency use approval, the EM, uh, WHO is likely to issue a recommendation to use it. If we wouldn't have this regulatory harmonization, the regulatory reliance, the stringent regulatory agencies, it would take much longer. But it is important that no corners are cut. It is imperative that we work in concerted efforts to build trust in COVID-19 vaccines. I do believe that, for example, it may be that, you know, there are people who can, like Mark Lokinen here, who can lead as by example, who are keen to show I'm personally impatient to be vaccinated. I'm already part of the vulnerable population age group. Therefore, I'm keen to, to get as early as possible a vaccine because I trust the scientists. I trust the regulators. Now, IFPMA and our members, we are working with key global organizations to inform the public on development, to explain how it was possible to come up with a few COVID-19 vaccines so rapidly. And we will work also on a digital communication campaign. We have already had discussions with the likes of UNICEF, WHO and others because this is really a concerted effort and we need to show that we are in there in solidarity, 
in partnership, and we will not rest until everyone is safe. Happy to answer questions. Back to you, Valentina.